Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dan Rundy. I'm a senior vice president and director of the Project on Prosperity and Development, as well as the Americas program at CSIS. Thank you for taking the time to join us today for the launch of a very important and timely report. Over the past year, CSIS has conducted uh, a research project that evaluates opportunities for the United States to rebuild its leadership role and its influence in multilateral institutions, and in particular, multilateral development institutions. So don't be scared off by the term multilateral development institutions. We take a very ecumenical and Big Ten approach to the concept of multilateral development institutions. We include things like standard making bodies, uh, development, uh, specialized development agencies, as well as uh, multilateral development banks and other and other institutions as well. The premise of the report is that member states can exert influence in the multilateral system through personnel, specifically by placing qualified candidates in leadership and senior staff positions. Our research has found that the United States has been losing influence in multilateral institutions over the past 30 years. Specifically, the United States' ability to compete in leadership races and place qualified representative representatives in top positions has diminished, and the presence of qualified Americans in staff positions has also declined. In the next three years, there will be leadership transitions in many multilateral organizations, including the UN Secretariat, regional development banks, and UN specialized agencies. The United States, working cooperation with like-minded partners, has an opportunity to support qualified candidates who will work to maintain a global order founded on liberal values, including respect for the rule of law, human rights, open markets, and free trade. Our study provides strategic direction and recommendations for the current and future U.S. administrations as they engage in the multilateral system. I'd really like to thank the expert panel that has kindly agreed to join us today. I'm really grateful to Ambassador Paul Dobriansky, who's a senior fellow at the Future of Diplomacy Project, the Belfer Center at the Harvard Kennedy School. Mr. Richard Ponzio, who's a director and senior fellow for global governance, justice and security at the Stimson Center. Ambassador Cinnamon Dornsife, who's a senior advisor to the Dean and director of the Foreign Policy Institute at Johns Hopkins School of International Advanced Studies. And my friend, Mr. Hugh Dugan, former special assistant to the president, senior director for international organizations and alliances at the National Security Council. I really appreciate all of you helping us with this. Before the panel discussion begins, I'm gonna hand it over to my friend, Ramina Vendor, who's a senior fellow at the Project on Prosperity Development, who has done the heavy lifting on this report, one of the co-authors, along with Kristen Cordell, who was a visiting fellow with us at CSIS last this past year, and has now gone back to USAID and one of the real talents at AID, along with Shannon McCown. So I'm really grateful for all three of Ramina, Kristen, and Shannon. So Ramina will present a quick PowerPoint that summarizes the key findings, methodologies, and recommendations of the project. Ramina, over to you. Well, thank you, Dan, and thank you for the distinguished panelists. I, before I begin my presentation, um, I'd like to thank Smith Richardson Foundation for sponsoring uh, this project, and my colleagues, as uh, you know, as Dan mentioned, Kristen Cordell and Shannon McEwen for, for all the research and uh, co-authoring the report. I'm going to share the my screen uh, for the PowerPoint. Um, just a minute. Um, okay, I, I hope you, everybody can see it. Um, so as Dan mentioned, uh, quickly, I'll just tell you a little bit about the project. Uh, what are some trends, uh, challenges uh, for the US and, and recommendations? Okay, I have some, okay, the project. So the main um, question we sought to answer is how can the United States rebuild its leadership role in multilateral development institutions in an era of strategic competition? As Dan mentioned, we looked at more than 200 organizations. Um, we didn't look at uh, defense organizations. It was mainly humanitarian, development, and governance organizations in the UN system, the IFI, so, um, you know, 
uh, institutions such as the World Bank, regional development banks, IMF, and standard setting bodies such as the OECD and others. So uh, the premise, as Dan mentioned, is that these institutions were founded on uh, universal uh, you know, liberal values of transparency, accountability, rule of law, respect for human rights, uh, free markets. And the U.S. has, you know, been part of, um, you know, a major funder and um, fun founder, yes, of, of these uh, institutions. Um, the U.S. has been losing ground uh, in the last 30 years, uh, both in the leadership and second tier management, as well as um, the staffing of, of these organizations. Uh, our competitors and allies are taking a more strategic approach uh, about leadership races, and they're also um, taking a more strategic approach about staffing with their own nationals at these institutions. So just quickly, uh, many of you know this, but the U.S. is uh, one of the biggest um, foreign aid donor um, in the U.N. system. It is uh, the biggest donor with almost 20 percent of the assessed and voluntary contributions. Um, in the regional development banks, uh, the U.S. is one of the um, you know, biggest shareholder, including the, the World Bank. Um, at UN uh, and in, he in leadership positions, what we see is that uh, the U.S. only leads uh, you know, one of the specialized agencies, if you consider the World Bank, uh, while China leads three. And in senior management uh, positions, both in IFIs and the UN system, uh, you know, we uh, have some positions, but, you know, we're not uh, the, the main uh, holder. Uh, this is a chart that shows some of the uh, our U.S. representation at UN agencies. Um, as you see, it has gone, declined through, you know, the years. Um, we did an exercise, uh, just a back on the envelope calculation, how much revenue the U.S. supplies and how much uh, presence we have, and we're grossly underrepresented in the UN. Um, for the World Bank and regional development banks, we don't have uh, public data, so uh, they don't disclose uh, data on nationalities uh, of their staff. Oops. So what are some um, U.S. challenges that we see in this area? The first is um, we don't have, the U.S. does not have a government effort a centralized government effort to monitor upcoming leadership elections in these institutions. As Dan mentioned at the beginning, um, you know, in the next two years, there's going to be 40 organizations that are changing leader. Of course, the United States is not going to, uh, you know, propose a candidate for each one. Some uh, organizations are more important than others. And we also need to work with our uh, allies. Uh, the, the challenge is that we fund uh, a lot of these organizations, but our relationship and funding is distributed across 23 um, agencies in the United States. So it makes the process a little bit um, decentralized and hard to coordinate. A second challenge is that we have um, we don't do a good job on work, you know, working um, with allies, like minded partners to put forward the best candidates. Um, so that is an area that, you know, uh, building coalitions, putting you know um, people early on the on the race, uh, and uh, crafting a good uh, you know um, uh, strategy with our allies. And then the third is that uh, for entry level positions and mid level positions, we also don't do a really um, you know good job in incentivizing both uh, career staff at the uh, State Department and the civil service to take on multilateral experience. Uh, we don't have a formal secondment program with these institutions. And for entry level positions such as, um, you know, the JPO program, for example, at the UN, um, internships, which, you know, it are future uh, talent pipelines and, and lead, you know, these people can uh, become leaders of these institutions and senior management. Senior management, um, we also don't do uh, you know, we, we don't provide good incentives and education uh, about these institutions. Um, so what are some recommendations? And this is my last slide, I promise, Stan. Um, so first of all, we propose that within the National Security Council, um, we uh, present a, a strategic approach to multilateral institutions through uh, something we call a multilateral policy council, somebody that's going to be looking across 
agencies and um, seeing, you know, when are the races coming up and what, you know, how we're going to respond. Um, second, we propose conducting a multilateral A review. This is uh, basically reviewing uh, all the agencies we fund and seeing what their, you know, development impact and value for money is for the United States because, of course, we can't um, be uh, present in all the agencies and take leadership in all the agencies. Um, so that's a good tool uh, to do. Third is um, we need to craft an implementation, a whole of government implementation plan. Uh, we need to track positions early. We need to build a talent pipeline for this, these positions and run professional campaigns. Uh, fourth, work with allies and my, like-minded partners. And fifth, for you know direct hires and junior staff, uh, we should provide better incentives um, in the uh, State Department and in other technical agencies. Uh, we should also report better uh, on U.S. representation. At, 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 at the moment, it's a little patchy. Um, and a setup, we propose setting up a PPP, a public-private partnership, to help um, educate and outreach you know, universities and others about these institutions, and also fund uh, internships and JPOs. Many of these internships, at least in the UN, are unfunded, and um, the JPO programs, we uh, only have 12 JPOs at the moment, while other countries such as France, uh, Germany have uh, you know, about 143, uh, 60, um, and China has 45 at the moment. So I'll stop and um, I'll hand it over back to uh, Dan for the panel. Thanks, Paula. Uh, sorry, sorry, thanks for me. And excuse me. I'm going to move to Ambassador Dobriansky. I want to turn to you and let me ask you, China currently poses the most significant economic security and diplomatic challenges to the United States. What is your view, Ambassador Dobriansky, on China's growing role in the multilateral system? And are there areas of collaboration or competition for the U.S. and China in this space? Great. First, uh, uh, congratulations, uh, Dan, to you. Romina, uh, outstanding report to you and your team. And Dan, if you don't mind, I want to just take a minute, if I can, just before answering your question, because uh, I really would like to say something about the report. First, I do want to congratulate uh, uh, you, Romina, outstanding job. Uh, this report is a wake-up call uh, to the United States. Uh, it is extremely well documented. Romina gave an overview. It's well documented. And what I think is very significant is the data that is specifically presented, the analysis which is has been done, and as Romina was referring to, a number of the kinds of challenges and also opportunities that are available and affordable to the United States. And I especially like the fact that the recommendations are very practical ones, they're ones that are achievable, they're not difficult to do, and uh, uh, I just want to say this comes at an important time, uh, an important time certainly in terms of uh, the overall uh, great power competition and our competition, in fact, indeed, not just with Russia, but with China, which is the focus here. So as to your question, uh, Dan, you asked me you know, specifically, uh, what are the areas, um, uh, uh, if you will, that are posing challenges by China and what are the areas of opportunity? Uh, China clearly poses a challenge uh, 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 to uh, us and to the West at large by its economic actions, its, uh, I would say, security steps, uh, as well as uh, the kinds of diplomatic challenges that have also been put forward. Um, I think that what we witness here, and as documented in the report, Beijing is definitively competing with the United States, both regionally and globally, and we've seen it take place in different ways, some as bilateral competition, some is in fact through uh, regional uh, and global institutions. And these international institutions are clearly uh, tools of statecraft, 
uh, that the Chinese have in fact used, have deployed in terms of advancing their particular uh, political agenda, which runs counter to ours in terms of our values and in terms of what we represent. A fundamental goal here is to seek the diminishment of U.S. Uh, power internationally and also to fragment our alliances and friendships, partnerships with other countries. And let me just say, finally, uh, well, two more things. One, I think it's worth noting that these institutions, sometimes uh, they are not fully understood, but these international institutions are ones that wield power. Uh, in fact, they do set global standards. One of the important ones, the World Trade Organization, which has been a fundamental issue as relevant to Chinese trade practices and uh, uh, the problems with international uh, intellectual property rights. And also we know that there are some key frameworks and rules of the game uh, relative to key issues as such as the area of trade and technology. And then let me also mention there's sensitive data and managing sensitive data. And then no less, let us remind ourselves that we're talking about the deployment and implementation and usage of billions of dollars uh, that are uh, spent around the world. So it does matter who is at the helm of these different international institutions. It wields influence and clearly uh, China has advanced its position in this regard because of using it as part of their malign statecraft. Uh, you asked about areas of cooperation. I've mentioned areas of competition. Areas of cooperation include such areas as climate change, uh, uh, which by the way, hasn't always been collaborative, but it should be an area of uh, cooperation. I would also say it seems to me that certainly in great power competition, even the area of countering terrorism, uh, we know that uh, uh, officials in Beijing have spoken to this ish issue, so have we. It could be and should be an area of collaboration. And should I mention the area of health? Uh, health, uh, uh, you know, viruses cross borders. Uh, there's a need for greater transparency here and openness. It should be an area of collaboration. I think, unfortunately, we've witnessed during this pandemic that has not been the case, uh, but that uh, traditionally, it's, it certainly is in the interest of all of our respective communities. So Dan, let me leave it there. Uh, I wanted to say something about the report. I went longer than expected um, because you dove into a question, but there you go. So no, thank thanks, you. So Ambassador Bransky. No, thank you. I'm so pleased you, you uh, yeah, thanks for elaborating and thanks for, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Mr. Ponzio, uh, please let me turn it over to you. Wonderful. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be part of this program, Dan, and your colleagues uh, marking the release of your new report. And I'd like to echo Ambassador Dobryansky's uh, positive sentiment shared earlier. I'd like to also, though, share three brief points on what I view to be the report's major contributions, as well as highlighting a few areas where I think further examination and follow through uh, can now flow from this important uh, effort. First, the basic premise of the report that quote, member states can exert influence in the multilateral system through personnel, specifically by placing qualified candidates in leadership and senior staff positions, something that's not talked about quite enough here in Washington. This finding is fundamental, even as the Biden administration, in contrast to its predecessor, has repeatedly claimed that diplomacy and multilateralism are back. It appears to be the case that in connection with first order foreign policy priorities, some of which uh, Ambassador Dobryansky referred to, the strategic competition with China, also uh, with Russia. In, in, in contrast, seriously investing in multilateral bodies, let alone placing Americans in their senior decision-making echelon, this is at best a secondary concern here in Washington. This is hardly a new phenomenon. With a strong sense of ambivalence towards the United Nations, beginning in the 1970s in U.S. foreign policy circles, both successive Republican and Democratic administrations have in effect combined to declining prestige and incentives for those in the U.S. government seeking to focus professional attention on multilateral institutions. And this includes those individuals who might be from state, USAID, other parts of the USG, 
seeking to be seconded to an international organization, even for a short one or two year assignment. In our expert consultations that fed into this uh, CSIS report, some of the participants encouraged the need for the State Department to revisit a longstanding idea of a multilateral track or a cone within the State Department. It's therefore helpful and appreciated that the, the report uh, highlights the need for the treatment of multilateralism as a cross-cutting competency for Foreign Service officers. Despite the continued ambivalence, President Biden did underscore, as uh, Ambassador just noted, the role of the UN and other multilateral institutions on critical transnational threats, starting with, of course, the pandemic and, and climate change. Moreover, what we've seen uh, in the recently announced Build Back Better World Initiative, or B3W, at the G7 Summit in June, this is in many ways an alternative to China's Belt and Road Initiative, or BRI. One can safely assume that the MOUs that many of the UN agencies have struck with China on the BRI, the same effort is now going to be undertaken with uh, those who are leading the B3W, starting with the United Nations, which is really uh, the, the White House, which is spearheading this initiative. For my second point, the CSIS report clears up a commonly held misconception that the U.S. is adequately or even viewed as overrepresented in staffing of multilateral organizations. While rightly acknowledging, and especially in light of China's growing influence in multilaterals, that, quote, international civil servants, regardless of their nationality, should be selected on the basis of objective criteria and should be expected to put the mission of their institution front and center, end quote, the U.S. must still make a more concerted effort to both motivate and make it easier for its citizens to consider careers and senior assignments in the multilateral system. During the moderated dialogue portion, I'm going to have a few more very specific ideas to share. Let me just note that uh, Secretary General Guterres has uh, had his second term just renewed in the last few weeks. We can expect a, a changing shuffling of the decks uh, uh, in terms of positions at the Assistant Secretary and Under Secretary General over the next six to 12 months. I hope the Biden administration will be seized with these uh, opportunities. So third and finally, I found the report's policy recommendations helpful in illuminating particularly its call for a multilateral policy council that would oversee a multilateral aid review tasked by Congress. Through both of these vehicles, uh, they would help to promote a, a central message of the report, promoting liberal values in multilateral bodies uh, that would give real meaning to that uh, phrase, but uh, also this key issue of uh, overseeing and then shepherding a strategy on appointments for uh, key leadership races. At the same time, I want to bring to everybody's attention that in the next few years, we have the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 2023, of course, championed by our own Eleanor Roosevelt back in 1948. And at the same year, the Secretary General is promoting a major conference. He just announced it two weeks ago. It would be during UNGA week in September 2023 on a more inclusive and networked multilateral system, modernizing, strengthening the UN system. These are all things that the Multilateral Policy Council should focus on. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Ambassador Dornsife, let me turn to you. Thank you, Dan. It is a pleasure to be here, and you have radical agreement from the panel so far. I very much endorse what Ambassador Dobriansky said, and indeed um, what Richard Ponzio has added. So I also join this chorus of praise for this outstanding report. It is absolutely timely, and I very much support the point that the recommendations that you put forward are very clear, very straightforward, and easy to follow up on. That said, I've got a couple of additions um, that I would like to suggest. Um, number one is to explicitly say in this whole of government approach that we need to pay much more attention to the multilaterals. And so the, I very much endorse this proposal for a multilateral policy council in the IFC. And with this whole of government approach, I was wondering, um, we didn't explicitly mention in this overview the role of Congress, but to make sure that congressional leaders and congressional staff are also very much on board with this proposal, because this will require funding and even though it is modest in nature, getting the attention of members of Congress and their staff as to the importance of this and what it means for the United States in this era of globalization 
And in this era of increased need for partnerships, it just couldn't be more important. On a, a very more minor note, but important in the world of the international financial institutions and the multilateral development banks, I would call on the Biden administration to nominate um, U.S. executive directors and alternate executive directors for all of the key international financial institutions that fall under the purview of the U.S. Treasury Department. Let's get an undersecretary of state in international affairs for the U.S. Treasury Department, and let's get the U.S. EDs and the alternate EDs who have been nominated prioritized for their confirmation. In terms of going forward, the idea that seems to me that really just struck me, um, and Romina, this was one of your, of your last points in terms of sponsored U.S. internships and the fact that, you know, we just have 12 of these so far. China's got 45 and Japan, do I get the numbers right, has 145. These are incredibly modest amounts of money. And working as I do at one of the world's leading graduate schools, the hunger for this kind of an appointment after graduation is immense. And so I would say that there would be enormous take up from the graduate schools of international affairs in the United States were these opportunities to be funded and publicized and made available. So again, congratulations. Um, it was just such a pleasure to be involved with this project from the outset. Thank you. Thanks, Ambassador. Hugh, thanks for being with us today. I'm so grateful you could join us. You're on mute, you. It's one of the, you, one of the challenges of, 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 of COVID life. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to be together. It is a compelling topic. Uh, Ambassador Dobryansky, Dobryansky gave us the imperative as to why this is critical uh, uh, beyond just uh, what happens in Turtle Bay. And Richard also raised some points about what the Biden administration may need to do or should be thinking of, as, as did Cinnamon. And as did Cinnamon, I also have a few additions to make, not to repeat what was already said, which I agree with and is so useful. But essentially, this is an exercise in addressing human capital the human capital of our delegation to the UN, of American citizens who are appointed by the Secretary General who we want appointed, a uh, human capital of those that we would seek to be elected to the specialized bodies, and the human capital of those staffing that uh, come with GPOs and other types of things. So there are very clear delineations as to the challenges and in, in looking at these various forms of human capital, and each one has its own complicated roadmap to make sure that we encumber as much uh, as many slots as possible and that we can be as effective as possible. Because I think the, the topic sentence of this entire valuable exercise is that we want very effective U.S. participation at the United Nations and throughout the United Nations system. And effective U.S. participation doesn't come from the Pentagon or from an agency, so to speak. It comes from people, people who are trained, well uh, versed on the ground, understand the process and can run with it and respect what others have done from other countries to work the process well. So we have to develop even more a guild-like guild mentality among our diplomatic representation on the delegation, uh, try to infect, so to speak, other Americans who are recruited into the international organization sphere with this guild-like mentality that we sit with others around the world who regard multilateral mechanisms as their first go-tos because they don't have an embassy in every country because they can use those as very efficient platforms. So they often send their best and they study these processes very well. And now it's just not the smaller countries and middle powers, but China has made such an aggressive uh, program of activity, recruiting people very young and teaching them and training them up through the ranks. And when they put them in these bodies, eventually JPOs or even more senior officers, they are masters of that chessboard. And I think to the extent that we can show that we respect the need for a mastery of the chessboard and not just to come barnstorming into the rooms whenever we need to or feel a, a pressure to do so. That respect for the guild-like mentality means that we too have to have that expertise. And I think uh, one of the first things that this country needs is to have a cultural change in the State Department that says that multilateral postings are indeed 
uh, valuable beyond belief, and that is the future of our effectiveness because these platforms that engage multilateral engagement are growing and growing. I mean, look at Facebook, look at social media. That Those are all platforms that engage multilateral uh, engagement by individuals, by members of NGOs, by affinity groups, by anybody who can log in. And we need to be able to come to the UN with all of those skills as delegates and that, that the process that the UN and other international organizations require for us to be effective among our colleagues and therefore to help recruit their interests, to help us advance our interests, to carry the day and to maintain the liberal international nature of these many organizations. So um, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you again for this valuable opportunity. Thanks. Ambassador Dobriansky, let me go back to you. Thank you. Um, uh, how can the State Department better support careers and experience in multilateral institutions? Right. Well, uh, thank you for that. Actually, it feeds right on what Hugh just mentioned about changing the culture. But the culture isn't so easy to change, I'll say. But let me let me let me say this. I, I love the comments of all of uh, the panel and uh, support much as what has been said. I'm going to start broad, if I can, uh, uh, Dan, because in the report, uh, Romina puts forward a whole of government approach. I love the fact you asked me about state, but I do think the report was right to po point out that it's useful looking at agency wide because there is talent across the bureaucracy. It doesn't only have to be the State Department. And I like that in the report. I wanted to highlight that. Secondly, I also want to uh, uh, just uh, mention and something that Ambassador Dornsife had highlighted and which was referenced in the report is this issue of looking at next generation. I think that you will find, and I find it myself from being associated with various academic institutions, you have a lot of young, very capable talent that would be really delighted to have this kind of opportunity, this experience, if given that chance. And I think she was right to also highlight relative to the issue of these fellowships, but also the State Department, is the issue of Congress and monies. So that goes to your question, the State Department. I would say this, I know Hugh mentioned change the culture, a culture I would say to be very practical, I think we need to incentivize this process. Usually when change takes place in the de department, and I look at it, if I could give an example, at the time of the uh, Iraq, uh, 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 you know, war, and when uh, uh, we sent officers over into Iraq, bluntly speaking, they were rewarded because it was a hardship posting, and when they came out. So here, okay, the terms are not the same, but the fact is there needs to be this incentivization, and you reference that in the report, and I think that's crucial here. If we're serious about it and we really want to invest in this strategy and this is great power competition, then we have to really back it up and look at an overall strategy. Two more points. I think you also reference, and this applies for the State Department, and that is in your report you mentioned working with allies and like-minded partners on coordinated plans. We saw how successful Australia was recently in terms of advancing its candidate. The State Department excels at those kinds of collaborative efforts. And by the way, that's also a kind of incentivization, if you will. So I would see that. And then finally, I, I, would, I would add that where you say find, attract, and place qualified and diverse U.S. personnel, here you need incentives. I've said that several times. You need flexibility. And you also highlight civil service. I want to mention that because I don't think it always has to be foreign service. Quite frankly, the civil servants would jump at opportunities to be posted. Many of them have been posted abroad for a two, three year assignment. Let's start looking at also those qualified individuals in the civil service realm and giving them those opportunities. So I am building upon some of the things that you've referenced yourself and trying to expand it more broadly. But it's an important question, Dan, very important, and one which I hope will be a concrete outcome, certainly, of your report and having an impact. Thank, Thank you. you.
Mr. Ponzio, you've written extensively on the UN, specifically on UN reforms, and make the UN more relevant for today. Could you talk a bit about some of the reforms that are needed to make the UN more compatible with today's complex global challenges? Great. Thanks, Stan. And of course, it's critical that we make progress on, on strengthening the UN to raise the profile of these institutions so that our political leaders want to invest time, more resources, care about these leadership races at the heart of your report. Um, you know, UN reform, it's been mainly the uh, focus of a small, even lonely group of scholars who are deeply concerned with these issues. But just in the last few uh, months, we can see uh, a sea change, uh, uh, at least possibility. I mentioned earlier the pandemic and the climate crisis, both quintessential global governance challenges. But it's uh, uh, President Biden's election uh, and his new team the rhetoric at least they're using and, and the speech last week, but the secretary general's second term and alongside that, and I think it has something to do with his second term, the courage and vision he shows through his new Our Common Agenda report. He put forward 90 recommendations only two weeks ago to upgrade and overhaul the UN system. I'll mention very quickly, uh, repurposing the trusteeship council to focus on global commons, including space, not just uh, the oceans or Antarctica. Uh, a second agenda for peace, building on the one that was quite famous is still used in the classroom from 1992. Uh, a global digital compact, really getting into the cyber uh, sphere uh, and an emergency platform to respond to complex global crises, which I think has continues to be the most high profile work of the UN system. I wish to briefly highlight one of my own related personal favorite ideas, a G20 plus, which would be introduced initially uh, that we introduced in our 2015 Albright Gambari Commission report, but it's something that the Secretary General speaks to in, in several core, core ways in his recent Our Common Agenda. The G20, as you know, is such an important uh, grouping that accounts for 80% of the world GDP, 75% of global trade, 60% of the population of our planet. Still, this important, in, albeit informal, grouping does not give representation to 174 other countries, mainly in the global south, or provide for other forms of structured, inclusive, and transparent engagement with those outside the club. But those non-members are also, of course, concerned with sustaining and sharing in the global uh, economy, maintaining economic stability, reducing global inequality, as I mentioned, but also preventing future pandemics and the climate crisis. For the G20 to become a globally legitimated premier forum of global economic and financial governance, it needs a modest upgrade to what we've termed a G20+. Plus. Uh, it would still have the G20 focusing on its forte, that's priority setting on the critical issues for the world economy, including in response to economic crises like the one we saw in 2008, 9, 10. An upgraded G20, though, would develop its own institutional memory by means of a modest standing secretariat, enabling the group to establish formal links with intergovernmental organizations. Now, here comes the connection with the wider grouping of states at the UN. Central to this proposal would be to have these powerful G20 heads of state already coming to New York for UNGA every September, but this time on a, at least every two-year basis, having special meetings with the wider membership, the other 193 member states, uh, at the start of the GA. In our most recent report, which we launched just last week during UNG, the UNGA High Level uh, segment, we outlined how a G20 Plus could help to shepherd a durable, uh, broad-based, and green recovery agenda from the current pandemic. I'll stop there. Thank you. Ambassador Doran Seif asked the bank's second largest sovereign borrower excluding co-financing China has received considerable infrastructure assistance from the Asian Development Bank. China is also the fourth largest recipient of the Asian Development Bank's loans. How do you foresee China's role in the Asian Development Bank going forward, uh, especially in the context of the rise of the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, a largely China-led institution funding infrastructure in Asia? Um, excellent question, Dan. So just let me start by <clears throat> talking about the role of China at the Asian Development Bank. A little, uh, a little known fact is that the Asian Development Bank was founded in 1966, but the People's Republic of China was not a founding member. They did not join until 1986 and began immediately borrowing 
at that point. They are currently the third largest shareholder at the Asian Development Bank. And going forward, I do not see this changing. I see their role continuing to be an important one because they get so many benefits, you know, such as the benefits that you've outlined in the report that you would like to see accrue to the United States and to Americans. China is really quite adept at leveraging its third largest shareholder position at the Asian Development Bank to make sure that their own staff are very adequately, their own nationals rather, are very well represented at management and senior staff levels, and indeed junior staff as well to make their way up through the ranks to eventually hold senior positions in management um, and directing operations. So the short answer is that China was not a founding member. It's really interesting when I was there, I, I called it the three China policy. Hong Kong, China was a founding member as was Taipei, comma, China. And so for those that are really interested in the future of the relationship between the United States and Hong Kong, comma, China, part of China, and Taipei or Taiwan, the Asian Development Bank was always a really interesting model for those to study how did that actually come about and what were the advantages that um, Taiwan, Taipei, comma, China enjoys as a founding member of the Asian Development Bank. But the, the main question is what is China's role going forward? It is going to maintain its third largest shareholder position. Obviously, they would love to be able to be sold numbers of shares by the other members, but I do not predict that that would ever happen. I, I just don't see any scenario. What is um, the role with the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank? As you rightly pointed out, Dan, that was founded in 2016. Um, there are now 103 members, many of whom are global and outside the region. And what is really interesting to me as I observe the AIIB's operations since 2016 up until the present, the number of co-financed operations was the majority of their lending in the early years. It has declined considerably and is now about 60% um, of its operations are co-financed. I was there with the World Bank, the IFC, the Asian Development Bank, the EBRD, and other existing, I call them legacy multilateral development banks. So you will see that the influence of the non-Chinese shareholders in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, I think is a really positive force for governance going forward. There's a really interesting model. I, I think I mentioned it in um, past conversations, but that the Germans have come up with a very unique model as there is a non-resident board and their member on the board of directors of the Asian Infrastructure Bank is in fact assigned to the German embassy. So that's a really interesting way to achieve relationship building that is not possible and information gathering that is not possible for a non-resident board and provides a lot more oversight. If and when the United States decides it is in their interest to join the AIIB, that would be a very interesting model to follow and I would commend it. Great, thank you, Ambassador. Do you, how should the U.S. government prioritize competing demands, organizations, and interests? What do we often overlook? Uh, we thank you for the question. And uh, I would say, how do we prioritize among them? Uh, we do it behind closed doors. We don't want the rest of the world to know what our priorities are, lest we undervalue one organization over another in their eyes. Uh, the world has a great expectation of the U.S. when it walks into an international organization. Uh, it's, uh, they expect us to know all of the issues, to be experts, to show leadership when no one else will, to be isolated in the end, which is often what happens in order to carry the water. Uh, so I wouldn't want to broadcast out there that we value one less than another uh, because the expectations on us are, are very strong and as, as they should be. When we walk in, we want people to be quiet and to listen to what we have to say. 
and to know that we've invested ourselves in that issue, whatever topic it might be, the locust infestation of South Africa, for instance, or um, that's important to Southern Africa. We can't we can't shortchange their strong interest in that one issue, for, for example. Um, so I would say that we need to respect each organization for its issues. Each organization does have its champion countries, its champion regions. We need those same countries when it comes to our big issues in different fora. We can't shortchange them. What they take is very serious by saying this is not a priority for the U.S. or we'll skip that meeting or we'll send a weak delegation or we won't really add value. I wouldn't want that messaging ever to get out there. We, we need their support. Um, I remember once at the U.N. when I served as a delegate, there was a a moment of silence for the recent passing of a head of state of a very small African country. And uh, I made sure that our ambassador was there to, to make a statement in support. But lo and behold, a couple of years later, that country was sitting on the Security Council. And that's one of the things they remember, that type of gesture. So we have to always value the interpersonal, the human contact, as I said earlier, and look at this exercise as an exercise in building up our human capital to be effective and to enable effective U.S. participation wherever we want to be. You know, you it's sort of like some of being effective in the multilateral system are just basic lessons my mom taught me when I was a kid. Just say please and thank you and show up for people when they're having a hard time and just be nice. Mm -hmm. Don't be a jerk. Do your homework. Mm -hmm. Sounds like do your homework mm -hmm. is a good thing as opposed to the dog ate my homework. Right. And, and mm -hmm. be, you know, get ahead of these things and, and work with friends and, and work relationships. Right. Mm -hmm. That's yes. common sense. Yes. Dan, I, Dan I, I don't mean to be out of the queue, but uh, uh, I wanted to make a recommendation to you and your team. And it's kind of derived from the comments that, that have been made. You had asked the question about to, to me about state. And you know what occurred to me? I didn't say, uh, you know, I think about uh, Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, who I do know and I've worked with. Uh, when uh, I was in the department as Undersecretary for Global Affairs. She was the Director General. And it's worth your presenting, if you haven't, the report to Ambassador Greenfield, uh, because I think that it would be of interest. Once you serve in that position as Director General, it is a position in the building which looks at personnel issues. And I, I think it would just be a very practical move. And then also, a number of comments have been made about uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres. I had the good fortune of working with him closely when he was in his previous position as the uh, uh, High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, he knows so many people from the department. And actually, I know for a fact that he's reached out to individuals to come himself you know, to get them seriously into, he's, he tries to get them into the, you know, into the UN. So there again, if you haven't presented the report to also him, to his office, I think you should. I think uh, I'd like to make those recommendations to we you. Will, we will. Ambassador, we absolutely will do. That's a great idea. We're, and, and we're hoping to host Ambassador Thomas Greenfield in a couple of weeks at the Global Development Forum. It's in mid-October. But regardless of that, I 100% agree with you. While I have you, Ambassador Briansky, how should we be working with like-minded allies to increase our influence and better promote our interests in the multilateral system, Ambassador Briansky? Well, you know, in a way, we, we do that, but I think this has been a domain, the very topic that we're addressing, we haven't really dug deep. Um, what do I mean? Uh, for example, I I know that when I uh, was undersecretary, all of the issues I had happened to be transnational. And so we worked very closely with so many allies on a range of transnational issues. We do that effectively. This is a talking about personnel and strategies. And I don't think we really were somewhat stovepipe. We don't, for example, Oh, sit down with the Australians, for example, or, you know, let's say the Brits or others and say, ah, you know, who, what are you looking at? Uh, what are, what positions are you going for? There isn't a collaborative effort. Um, now, we are part of, at least it's been traditionally the Western and other group. 
I mean, you have other countries that are part of, say, the European group, and they collaborate from within. Uh, and there's usually a kind of rotation there that exists. So I, I would just say, I think several ways that we can uh, to really go to the heart of your question. One, I think we need to not just only talk about substantive issues, but really look at how we can strategize for positions together. Um, even, even if we're not necessarily like with the Europeans in the same grouping, or even with the Latins in the same grouping, and it goes on from there. So we, we need to make that effort. And I don't think we really have. It's, it's kind of like we mobilize around our own candidate and then, oh, we hear that candidate was out there. The second, the second area is something that I think that, you know, I know that there was an interest in, and I think you touched upon in the report, and that's also lessons learned. And lesson learns from going ahead and advancing candidates and failing. And why? What went wrong? And see, that's something also, I think there needs to be a kind of heart-to-heart -heart conversations, a conversation with countries that do have you know, uh, like-minded interests and are interested in collaborating, co collaborating in this particular domain. So th those would be two of my comments. I'd love to hear comments from our, our other panelists. Yeah. I'm sure they have views. So Mr. Ponzio, I'd welcome your thoughts of us, but also you, I wanted to make sure get a chance to talk, please address some of the, the things that have already been said, but I want to also get a chance to hear from you about what are some of your recommendations for the Biden administration, how the U.S. can field a good pipeline of young talent and fill positions of leadership with qualified and diverse Americans. I know it's something very important to the Biden administration. Great. Thank you, Dan. And I'll definitely build on the fellow panelists and, and, and get to the younger generation. I do want to refer back to this opportunity with the second term of Guterres, uh, the changing of the guard. The filling of senior echelon positions, though, and this could be a nice monic for your for your report, the U.S. needs to play the long game better. Something we've heard from all of my fellow panelists is how our European and increasingly Asian allies, especially now China, are very good at skillfully starting at something you emphasize, go bigger on the GAPO program. But I'd like to bring in, as I have in previous consultations for this report, that the mid-career track is equally important because you know you get talent from all over for multilateral institutions, from NGOs, from within the USG, from other uh, international organizations. And the Japanese, I've noticed, are particularly skillful both in development agencies and then in core UN secretary departments, placing mid-career professionals. And voila, the next uh, 10 to 15 years, you have people like uh, Under Secretary General for Disarmament uh, Affairs, Azumi Nakamitsu, uh, who came through the mid-career program ranks. Um, so they've been very successful in getting these uh, top jobs landed. The other, on the junior uh, point that you mentioned, you know, it's back to what several of our colleagues have been saying. We have these world-class two-year master's programs of international affairs. The Biden administration and future administrations teaming up, I would say, two key organizations the United Nations Association of the USA and their, and their local chapters where these uh, in institutions are located, and the Academic Council and the UN system, which is housed at Georgetown University here in Washington, DC, together making a full court press to make the case for careers in multilateral institutions. And of course, that has so much to do though with curricula, with uh, research opportunities. Somebody mentioned internships. Those are all extremely important and should be supported. Young Americans getting a taste of what it's all about to work in these multilateral institutions. A final point, and, and this is uh, getting at the other core message of promoting liberal universal values. Uh, I'd like to just share my own experience, uh, having spent about a decade in the UN, six different uh, fragile and conflict affected states. In each of those settings, I worked on democratic political reforms or market economic reforms, things at the core of our foreign policy. And um, uh, something I'm, I'm most proud to have been associated, though, is the 2002 Human Development Report, UNDP's flagship publication. It was on deepening democracy in a fragmented world. It was the only second major UN report, uh, the first being uh, Boutros Boutros Ghali's Agenda for Democracy. But you might remember that was in his waning days of his uh, quick uh, one term in office. So this uh, 2002 report, though, got a lot of attention and yet one more example of personnel being policy, of getting our personnel in key positions 
can advance these universal liberal values, which I think is uh, such an important message from the CSIS report. So Ambassador Jordan, so I like Manila and I like the Asian Development Bank and I like visiting it. I like mango juice. I like the it's, the weather's interesting. I like the Philippines, a beautiful country. And the ADB is a really important institution that's overlooked often in D.C., both in policy circles and elsewhere. So how do we ensure that capable, qualified and effective Americans are placed in positions of leadership at the ADB? And what about staff positions? Um, excellent question, Dan, and I love your background <laughs> on Manila. It is not the place that people are flocking to go. Um, for example, the EBRD is based in London. The Inter-American Development Bank is here in Washington, D.C. So uh, when we compare Manila um, with Washington, D.C. and London... Um, I- I'm going with Manila, but maybe <laughs> I'm a minority. <laughs> Maybe so. Yeah. Um, or if we think um, so, it's really not the location, obviously. It's really the challenges of the region, the opportunities to make a difference with your life work and to have a really important opportunity to work with like minded colleagues. There is an amazing esprit de corps among the management and staff at the Asian Development Bank. I just remember my first day on the job when I got there in January of 1994 was when I first started um, in the USED's office. I started as the alternate director. I thought, oh my gosh, how in the world am I ever going to get to understand and know this place? But, you know, um, after three years, um, I, we had a division of labor in the office and our ambassador that at that point, um, Ambassador Linda Young, took upon herself the relationship with capitals and donors. And she delegated to me the understanding of how things work at the bank and the running of the office, which I felt was just a great division of labor and a great gift to me because I did get to know how the institution worked and made friends among the staff. By the way, that is not encouraged by management, but when you've got a resident board, you know, alluding to what I said earlier about the very clever idea that the Germans came up with for their representative to the AIIB board, the advantages of the resident board or that you can really exercise your oversight and your accountability purposes with extreme effectiveness because you're right there on the ground. So to answer your question, how can we get more qualified Americans there? You know, Dan, one of the things that really struck me, I was there on that board position for uh, eight years was it in the entire eight years, there was one, count them one, secondment from an executive agency to the Asian Development Bank. And to me, that just took my breath away. When you talk about the secondments, especially from the Japanese, they are masters, um, you know, as you've said, uh, Richard, at placing their staff in mid-career positions, then rotating them back to another position within the civil service, you know, to Ambassador Dobriansky's point. Absolutely. This is a way. So secondments to me is low hanging fruit for this Biden administration and the executive branch of government here to be able to get qualified staff into positions at the ADB. Then, based on their experience, they could maybe later be nominated to come back in senior staff positions or management positions such as one of the vice presidents or heads of one of the operations departments or the general counsel or director of the private sector department. So I would say secondments is the low hanging fruit. I think we've already talked about the eagerness of the next generation for internships and funded junior professional opportunities. So I would say those are the very quick ways. Number one, secondment. Number two, uh, making available funded, well publicized opportunities for junior professionals to join at the entry level. And that way you can build up a a good qualified pool of qualified Americans to later take senior positions. I mean, I've got lots of things I I could say to close this out, but I want to give each of you perhaps a minute to make sort of a close, make a closing thought. Let me start with you, Richard Ponzio, Hugh Dugan, Ambassador Obriansky, and Ambassador Dornsife. So let me start with you, Richard. I guess I'll just share a point that I shared in our earlier consultations feeding into this uh, fantastic report that 
<laughs> our country more than any other was responsible for creating the UN system, hosted the San Francisco conference, host of the main headquarters in New York. And it's like democracy, use it or lose it. And, and, and it, this ambivalence that I referred to earlier is concerning uh, Democratic and Republican administrations, especially, you know, let's be honest, the last few years, America first policy associated with populism around the world that was very much anti-multilateralist in nature against global cooperation when we need it most. So it goes without saying we have global challenges today and it's not just a stronger revitalized UN system. Part of the answer to that is getting the right people, including from our own country. We have a lot of talent in and outside of government. And I think this report will make uh, really uh, strong recommendations to getting us closer to where we need to be in, in terms of a 21st century UN system. You? Uh, the right people is a very powerful phrase here because you know they're supposed to be independent when they're in the secretariat and, and they, they take an oath to the charter not to take any guidance from capital. Now China has uh, repeatedly abused this and others do as well, uh, but the US really wants to have an independent international civil servant service. So when we talk about getting the right Americans, we have to let go of them once they're there and hope they don't become clients of the organization over time or, be, or they become anti-American just to survive in the bureaucratic rank and file for their career purposes. And this is something the report didn't touch upon, but I, I think we need to note that, that there is a bit of a clientitis that can take place and that can be kryptonite toward effective US participation. So we need the right people who remember the importance of international liberal values in everything they do, the importance of an independent international civil service uh, so that it stands on its own and, and is an honest broker in the world for the member states. Uh, just to close, and thank you again for this wonderful report and the opportunity to speak, but just to close, whenever a U.S. delegate goes into a meeting room or an American goes into the secretariat for a job, their last name is all the same. Their last name is the United States. They still have their first name, and that's the important point of entry for all of our interlocutors, to know that that first name is approachable, has interpersonal skill, is intelligent, respects the process, and works it well. So I, we need right people who are going to have that last name, whether they want it or not. But they've got to have uh, the ability to, to market and present their first name in a way that can enable effective participation with colleagues from around the world. Ambassador Dobriansky. Uh, uh, great power competition has uh, definitely become the organizing principle of foreign policy. And this report, I think, certainly takes that on board and draws attention and calls attention to how China in particular has been using uh, the international institutional system to its regional and global advantage. And the report puts forward some very practical steps, uh, steps that the United States can and should be taking in not only alone, but in conjunction with allies and friends. And I think it's it's very timely, very relevant. And uh, just thank you for bringing us together today to discuss uh, a, a most significant policy issue and one that has uh, sorely been overlooked. Thank you. Thank Ambassador Dornstein, I'll give you the last word. Um, thank you, Dan. So I just endorse what my two panelists have just said. Ambassador Dobriansky, very eloquent summary, um, beautifully stated. My call to you, Dan, um, and to all of all of you at CSIS is with this remarkable report. I think you've done a wonderful job gathering those of us who've been part of your focus group and indeed uh, on this panel. But you need a champion in the NSC, in the US UN in the Treasury Department, in the State Department, uh, in the two branches of Congress to champion the findings and recommendations. And they're so practical and so easy to follow through. So I would charge you with the task of finding your champions in those branches of government and carrying forward and anything that I or I'm sure any of us can do to support you in that, I'd be delighted. Thanks. Thanks a lot. We've got our homework assignments and our work cut out for us. Thanks very much, everybody. This okay. is great. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.